Hello, I'm Ms. Ginsburg with No Adam, and today we're going to be reading Environmental Science. This is a lab manual in Unit 7. Section 1 How Rocks and Water Interact. Sinkhole in Louisiana. One day in 2012, a massive hole opened in the ground in southern Louisiana. The force of this event was so strong that entire trees were flipped upside down. Their roots faced the sky. Beneath the water, the hole measured 117 meters, or 384 feet, deep. This is roughly the height of a 40-story building. Almost a year later, the hole grew even larger. Within 30 seconds, a row of 40-foot-tall cypress trees was completely swallowed up by the water. This massive hole was the result of two interacting Earth systems, the hydrosphere and the geosphere. Remember that the hydrosphere is the Earth system that includes all of the water on the planet. The geosphere is the Earth system that includes the rocks, soil, landforms, and interior of the planet. Water has been carving out holes in Earth's rocky interior over millions of years. As water seeps into the ground, it erodes underground rocks. Sometimes it erodes it so much that the rock can no longer support the land above it. When this happens, a sudden collapse of the land on the surface can occur. The result is a sinkhole. A sinkhole is a hole in the ground formed when water has dissolved underground rock to the point where it can no longer support the land surface. Most sinkholes are only 10 to 12 feet in diameter. Some, like the sinkhole in Louisiana, are hundreds of feet in diameter. This is large enough to swallow trees, cars, and even an entire building, even entire buildings. The red part of the map shows Bayou Corn. This is where the sinkhole appeared. This photograph of the Bayou Corn sinkhole was taken from a helicopter in 2012. A changing planet. Sinkholes form because of processes that occur underground. These processes can occur gradually or all of a sudden. To understand what leads to giant holes appearing on Earth's surface, we need to begin with the rocks that make up Earth's surface. Remember that these rocks do not stay the same. Energy is constantly breaking them down and reforming them through heat and pressure in the rock cycle. Water and the rock cycle. Water plays a major role in the rock cycle, as well as in the formation of sinkholes. As water moves over rocks, it shapes those rocks through weathering and erosion, reshaping Earth's surface. The rock cycle refers to the process that processes that form, break down, and reform rock from one category to another. Water shapes rocks. The movement of water downhill on Earth's surface is the largest source of weathering and erosion on the planet. As water travels, it constantly rubs against soil and rocks. It will eventually break down these surfaces into tiny pieces of dirt and minerals that are eroded, carrying along with the water to new locations. Water also shapes rock underground. Hydrogeology is the study of geology that focuses on the distribution and movement of groundwater in the soil and rocks of Earth's crust. Groundwater is the supply of fresh water found beneath Earth's surface in the pores of soil, sand, and rock. The underground layer of rock, sand, or soil that holds groundwater is called an aquifer. Groundwater is in constant motion. Just like on the surface, gravity pulls groundwater downward. This is part of the water cycle. Water on Earth's surface seeps into the ground, just like a jar of sand slowly absorbs water. Properties of rocks. Groundwater generally moves more slowly than water in a stream, in stream, or river. This is because it must pass through the interconnected pores of the rock. The speed at which groundwater moves depends on both the rock's porosity and its permeability. Porosity refers to the amount of space between particles in a substance. 
Permeability refers to the ease with which substances, such as water, move through a material. Porosity determines how much water a material can hold, while permeability determines whether water can move through the material. Rocks that are both porous and permeable are most likely to hold water. Groundwater fills the spaces between porous rock underground. Where sinkholes occur. Sinkholes occur because of how groundwater moves through the soil and rocks on Earth's crust. Sinkholes are common in areas where the land sits on top of rock that can naturally be dissolved by groundwater. One such rock is limestone. Limestone is a kind of porous sedimentary rock. It is formed primarily from the skeletons of marine organisms. As groundwater seeps into the ground, it absorbs carbon dioxide and reacts with decaying vegetation. As a result, the water becomes slightly acidic. As this acidic water fills the limestone's pores, it dissolves the rock. This results in caverns and empty spaces within the rock. Over time, the limestone erodes so much that it can no longer support the land above it. Human activities and sinkholes. In addition to naturally occurring sinkholes, sinkholes can also occur because of human actions. These actions include digging wells and drawing too much water from aquifers. When people withdraw too much water from an aquifer, they can increase the risk of a sinkhole forming. When too much groundwater is withdrawn from an aquifer, the pores that were once filled with water become filled with air. Air provides less support than water. This makes the surface, the land surface, less stable. When large amounts of precipitation fall, the underground rock can no longer support the added weight of the rain. This causes the land to collapse, forming a sinkhole. A sinkhole is formed in Maryland along the side of a highway. Predicting sinkholes. Small sinkholes happen all of the time. Many of these sinkholes don't cause a lot of damage. Sometimes, however, they can be catastrophic. Because of this, scientists and engineers are trying to develop technologies that help them predict where sinkholes are likely to occur. Scientists believe that 10% of Earth's surface can experience sinkholes. In the United States, sinkholes are most common in Alabama, Florida, Kentucky, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Texas. However, scientists still can't say exactly when a sinkhole will occur. Developing technologies. There are technologies that can determine if the rock underneath the ground is full of holes. This makes it more likely that a sinkhole will occur. It won't necessarily indicate when a sinkhole might occur. This makes it hard for people to prepare. In response, engineers from NASA are working on a new technology that can predict when sinkholes might form. This technology uses a plane that has radar technology and sends out electronic pulses. These pulses allow scientists to map out how Earth's surface is shifting. For example, the technology picked up signals that the ground around the sinkhole in Louisiana was moving at least a month before it collapsed. This map shows regions in the US where sinkholes are most likely to occur. Section two, water and human development, studying Earth's water with satellites. Two satellites are orbiting Earth with a specific mission. They measure interactions between the shape of Earth's surface and gravity. The data they have gathered tells scientists about changes to the water cycle over time. It turns out when you study the small changes in Earth's gravity field, that gives us a whole set of new information about how water is moving around on the Earth that we never had before, NASA scientist Jay Famigliotti told High Country News in 2016. Measuring changes to groundwater. Remember that all matter has gravity and that more massive objects have more gravity than less massive objects. A region that has more water on the ground has more water weight. Because of this, it has a slightly greater gravitational pull. This pull acts on the satellites, pulling them slightly closer to Earth. In contrast, a region that has less water has slightly less of a gravitational pull. This means the satellites float a little higher away from Earth's surface. 
the satellites provide ongoing data. Because of this, scientists can tell when there's been a flood because the increased water weight pulls down on the satellites. They can also tell when an aquifer has lost water because there is less of a gravitational pull causing the satellites to float higher. These data allow scientists to make maps of places around the world that are gaining or losing water every month. These satellites measure changes to Earth's surface based on slight differences in the surface's gravitational pull. Changing aquifers. The amount of water on and below Earth's surface and in the atmosphere is different around the world. For example, about 40% of the planet is arid or semi-arid. These regions don't receive much precipitation and have little surface water resources. Other parts of Earth are wet, receiving precipitation year round or during certain seasons. The amount of water in a particular location changes over time. Some places receive more precipitation during a particular season or from one year to the next. The amount of water in an aquifer also changes over time. Aquifer recharge happens when water reaches the aquifer, replenishing it. This happens when precipitation seeps into the ground. Aquifer discharge happens when water leaves the aquifer. This can happen when plants absorb some of the groundwater through their roots or when the groundwater seeps into a spring or river. Aquifer discharge can also happen when people use wells. A well is usually a pipe in the ground that reaches the water table, the highest point in an aquifer from which water can be obtained. This water can then be brought to the land surface by a pump. In arid or semi-arid regions, there is very little precipitation to replenish surface water resources. In these regions, most people depend on groundwater for their water needs. Some trees take in groundwater through their roots. Wells pump groundwater, bringing it to the surface. Depleting groundwater. If too much groundwater is removed from an aquifer, it can dramatically upset the natural balance of the water cycle. Aquifers are naturally balanced when the amount of water being added to the aquifer from precipitation is roughly the same as the amount of water leaving the aquifer. If the rate of discharge from an aquifer is greater than the rate of recharge, the aquifer will become depleted. Some aquifers take hundreds or thousands of years to recharge. Satellites tell of depleted aquifers. The data collected by the pair of satellites orbiting Earth show that groundwater is being depleted in most of the known human, um, in most of the known aquifers around the world. However, people don't know how much water is left in these aquifers. This worries many people. Groundwater accounts for about 90% of the world's easily accessible fresh water. About 1.5 billion people today depend on groundwater for their drinking water. In the United States, 50% of people in the United States use groundwater for drinking water, agriculture, and industry. This is especially true in the western United States, where it is semi-arid. This map is made from the satellites orbiting Earth. The aquifers in red have water loss. The aquifers in blue have water gain. Analyzing data on groundwater resources. Groundwater pumping can also harm ecosystems. Because groundwater is so connected to surface water, the removal of groundwater impacts the quality of surface water. When people pump too much water from an aquifer, there is less water that is discharged to streams and rivers. This harms the aquatic habitats of many species, including fish and amphibians that live in streams. Human development impacts groundwater resources in another way. Many human-made surfaces, such as pavement and concrete, are impermeable. When water falls to the ground, it cannot absorb into pavement or concrete. As a result, it does not reach the aquifers and therefore cannot recharge them. Studying groundwater. Because of the critical role that groundwater has in supporting life, scientists are trying to better understand groundwater on Earth. Groundwater is difficult to study because it is underground. It is also unevenly distributed around the planet. As a result, 
scientists map the geology and the underground structures of different areas to understand how groundwater moves through different materials and how quickly it is recharged in various locations. To do this, scientists use deep wells up to 2,000 feet underground to monitor the groundwater and to observe what happens when additional groundwater is removed. Scientists monitor groundwater to better understand how it moves through different materials and how quickly it is recharged in various locations. Polluted aquifers. Scientists also study the effects of water pollution on aquifers. Water pollution is the contamination of natural water bodies by substances that harm organisms and the environment. It can be natural or caused by humans. Natural contamination can occur from naturally occurring mineral or metallic deposits in sediment. Human pollution. Human pollution is caused by many different sources. Agriculture is one source of water pollution. Farmers add fertilizers and pesticides to increase crop production. When these chemicals are applied to a field, some of them enter the surface water. As a result, the water runoff will contain large amounts of pollution that can then seep into groundwater. There are two broad kinds of pollution, point source pollution and non-point source pollution. Point source pollution can be traced back to a single identifying incident such as a leak in an underground storage tank or waste discharging from a factory. Non-point source pollution is discharged over a wide land area and comes from many different sources and locations. As water runoff moves over the ground, it picks up and carries away pollutants from many different sources. These pollutants can include excess fertilizers, pesticides, and oil spilled from vehicles or pipes. Groundwater can become polluted in several ways. Surface water can become polluted from various sources, including oil, fertilizer, pesticides, and animal waste. As surface water seeps into the ground and becomes part of an aquifer, it can carry these pollutants with it. The kinds of rock that surround an aquifer play a role in the likelihood of the aquifer becoming polluted. There are two kinds of aquifers, confined aquifers and unconfined aquifers. A confined aquifer has a layer of non-porous material, such as clay or shale, between the water level and ground level that separates the water from ground level. This non-porous material acts as a buffer because water cannot move freely through it. Therefore, it can prevent or reduce the amount of pollution that reaches the aquifer. In contrast, in an unconfined aquifer, there are no layers of non-porous material between the water level and the ground level. These aquifers are more at risk of becoming polluted because there is not an impermeable layer between them and the source of pollution. In other words, if anything leaks or spills into the soil above the unconfined aquifer, it will seep into and contaminate the water. Aquifers can be either confined or unconfined. It depends on the properties of rocks that surround it. Section three, water filtration. The problem of water pollution. In 2011, a team of students and engineered, engineers traveled to a small town in Bolivia in South America. Remember that engineers are different from scientists. Scientists gain knowledge from experimentation. Engineers apply that knowledge to create new technologies that solve problems. The problem of polluted water. The team of students and engineers had a problem, how to provide clean drinking water for two small villages in Bolivia. Similar problems face engineers around the world as the human population continues to grow. According to some estimates, more than 1 billion people around the planet are affected by polluted water. This is a map of South America. And here's a picture of sewage flowing from a pipe into a lake. It's one way that water becomes polluted. Engineering a solution to water pollution. Once the team of students and engineers in Bolivia identified their problem, they did background research. They learned that groundwater is some of the cleanest water on earth. 
This is because the particles of rock that make up aquifers act as a natural filter. As water moves from Earth's surface underground, the water is filtered. Filtration is the process of separating solid matter from a fluid by having the fluid pass through the pores of another substance called a filter. Because they act as filters, aquifers provide an ecosystem service. Ecosystem services are the positive benefits that an ecosystem provides to people. By the time water has moved through the aquifer, many pollutants have been removed. Coffee pots and aquifers. Picture a coffee pot. When you pour hot water into the pot, it mixes with coffee grounds. A coffee filter traps the coffee grounds but allows liquid coffee to flow through. Coffee filters are semi-permeable. They have pores that are large enough for water to travel through, but small enough that coffee grounds cannot move through them. The coffee grounds get trapped in the filter. Aquifers work in the same way. Some aquifers have cleaner water than other aquifers because they are better able to filter out contaminants as water moves through them. Scientists have to look at an aquifer's properties and the porosity and permeability of the rock to figure out how well it can filter water. Coffee filters are similar to aquifers because they allow water to flow through but trap the coffee grounds. Design possibilities. After they researched their problem, the team in Bolivia surveyed the materials available for this problem. They had to analyze the pore size of any material used to filter out pollutants. The smaller the pore size is, the purer the water will be. This is because everything that cannot fit through the pores will be filtered out. However, water flows more quickly through larger pore sizes. Any filtration technology would need to balance the need to filter out pollutants with the need for water to move through it. The team next brainstormed possible solutions that could solve the problem. After weighing the pros and cons of various ideas, they decided on a solution. Their solution used sand and gravel to filter the water. They drew a hand-sized scientific diagram of the prototype. They used their diagram to build a prototype. Once they had their prototype, they were able to test it. The goal of testing is to find out how well the prototype solves the problem. The team wanted to know how well their mixture of sand and gravel filtered out pollutants. They tested the water purity after it filtered through the prototype. They then analyzed their data to see how well their prototype filtered water. They used this analysis to determine whether the technology should be refined or replicated. After several tries, they designed a technology that effectively filtered out the majority of water pollutants, leaving behind water that was safe to drink. This kind of engineering solution is common in communities around the United States. Many communities have designed filtration basins that use sand, gravel, soil, or other porous materials to filter the water. Sand is the most common filter material although some filters have used wood chips and even leaf mold to purify water. This is a filtration prototype. I learned a lot reading environmental science, and I hope that you did too. I'll see you tomorrow with another one. Bye!